That was last week's title. <clears throat> the title of this week's message is The Beauty of an Extravagant Worship. Our text this morning, of course, is found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. We read verses 1 through 11 just a little bit ago. We've been going through this journey, as I said earlier, we've been going through this journey of the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark has 16 chapters. The final six chapters are devoted to the events that occur in the week leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. When you're in the 13th chapter, the Lord spoke about future events surrounding His glorious second coming. Then you come to chapter 14, and He picks up this narrative that will lead us to the cross, and beloved, what I like is that empty tomb. In the previous chapter, our Lord had been, in previous chapters, our Lord had been involved in an ongoing verbal debate with the Jewish leaders. And you'll remember that there was a great deal of conflict as they tried unsuccessfully to get the Lord to incriminate Himself by saying something wrong. And in the 14th chapter, you have this account of this woman anointing Jesus with perfume. The same account is also recorded in Matthew chapter 26 and John chapter 12. These all take place in Bethany a few days before the crucifixion. And when we combine the three accounts, Matthew, Mark, and John, we learn more about the details about what took place this evening. And again, this, story, this is a story about a woman who performed an outrageous act of worship as she knew how. And the Lord said about her act of worship that she has done a good deed for me. This morning I want to share with you what I believe are just five truths, and I'm sure we could find more, but I want to focus in on five truths about the beauty of an extravagant worship. The first is this. Worship is a personal act of love. Worship is a personal act of love. Now, we can worship the Lord with other people. We do that on Sundays. We do that on Wednesday nights. You do that maybe at home around, around the dinner table. You worship the Lord and you, you have a worship time there. Or we can worship the Lord individually by ourselves. And since our message this morning is about worship, I want to give you a, what is my simple definition of worship. Worship is, the, is an expression of adoration to God. Let me say that again. Worship is an expression of adoration to God. Now that expression can take many forms, can it not? In the Hebrew word that we get our word worship, it means to bow down. And that's an expression of humility or, or adoration. We, down, bow, we bow down before Almighty God and worship Him. And we say, you are Creator God. We sung that in one of the songs. You are cr cr Creator. You are Sustainer. You give life. Without you, there would be nothing. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and we bow down before you, God. The Greek word for worship literally means to kiss toward. It's kind of like where we get the idea of throwing a kiss to someone. I'm sure you might have done that with your kids when they were little. You know, they said something or they were going to school and your mama or daddy maybe threw them a kiss. That's what the Greek word literally means, is to throw them a kiss. And so we, we throw a kiss, we kiss God. Because He is creator God, He is sustainer. In John's account, we discover even more than here in Mark's account about who was present at the mill. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3 tells us this, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there. And Martha, as always, was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him, Mary, Mary then took a pound of very costly 
perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now I like to imagine this and I hope you do the same thing when, when you read scripture and especially the, the gospels. I hope you try to put yourself in that, that story and that account because it makes it just more alive. And I can just imagine Martha was serving. She's in the kitchen. She's cooking. And that is her way of worshiping God. There are just some people like that, some women like that. They love to cook and they love to bring whatever they cook to the church or to, to somebody that's in the hospital or whatever. And that is their way of worshiping God. Martha was one of those women who, who had, I believe, had a, a subscription to better homes and gardens and southern Israeli living. Mary, on the other hand, she began to wonder what she could do to show her love to the Lord. Martha, my sister, is in the kitchen. She's doing all this preparation and all this cooking, to, and that's her way of worshiping God. But what do I have? What can I do, Mary's thinking. And so to me, she slips out and she goes and she gets this, her prized possession an alabaster container of spikenard, a very expensive perfume. And she grabs that alabaster jar and she returns to the dinner and she returns and boldly approaches the Lord. Now ladies, I'm sorry to tell you, but we need to remember that in this time period, in this culture, women were to stay in the background. I know that would give some of you fits. But that's okay. I bet it gave Mary fits. But she grabbed that alabaster jar and she was so worshiping God, so focused on the Lord that she forgot about where she was and the culture that she was in and she just approaches the Lord and she pours out the perfume on him as her act of worship. And I know that no word is recorded here, but I believe that in her heart, in Mary's heart, Mary was saying maybe something like this. And she's directing it at the, the Lord Jesus Christ. In her heart, I think she's saying, I recognize that you are God in flesh. That you are Yahweh. You are Jehovah in flesh the flesh, right here in my house. And I want to thank you for changing me from what I was to what I am now, a follower of yours. And this is my offering of worship to you. Now, I know those words are not recorded in the scripture, but can't you imagine somebody thinking those things? And I'm sure that Mary was no different than we are today. Matthew and Mark tells us that Mary anointed Jesus' head, but John says that she poured it on his feet. So which one was it? Was it his head or was it his feet? You want to know what I believe? I believe it was both. And it's easy to imagine that Mary started pouring the expensive perfume on the Lord's head and some of it remained in the, in the vial and she just took that and poured it on his feet. Because there was so much perfume that she just took her hair and then she started wiping his feet with it. And what a beautiful picture of worship. Amen? Because you remember that word worship in the, in the Hebrew means to bow down? That's what this woman did. She de bowed down before Christ. God in human flesh. And worshipped him. Matthew Redman wrote a song entitled Blessed Be Your Name and the Heart of Worship and also he wrote a book that's called The Unquenchable Worshiper and here's what he writes about Mary. It was the worship of a woman who didn't know the rules. Her having to be in the background. An unpredictable, untamed heart on a quest to see Jesus glorified. People in love do a lot of crazy things. And you know we've all been guilty of that, amen? When, we were, when we're in love with the Lord, we just do things that the rest of the world looks at you and go, 
Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And you look back at him and you just kind of go, because I love the Lord. Because I love the Lord. That's why I did it. I just want to praise him. There are so many different ways to worship. But worship primarily is a personal act of love. Whether we do it corporately as a body, a believer here at Grace Baptist Church of St. Genevieve, or whether you do it at your home, out on the deck, out on the lake, out in your backyard, you're out there and you're thinking about Jesus Christ and what he's done for you and how he saved you from going to hell to now you're going to heaven. You're from sinner to saint and you just start worshiping God. And you just start thinking to yourself, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I think there ought to be a song written about that that says something like, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. There ought to be a song written about that. But that's worship. And it's primary, uh, primarily a personal act of love. Number two, worship involves a costly act of surrender. Worshiping, listen, worshiping God is not coming to God to get something. Amen? Worshiping God is not coming to get something. It is coming into the presence of God to surrender something to Him. Namely, your life and my life. I hear people, not here, but I hear people going to church and they go to church on Sunday morning or Sunday night or whenever, and I hear them talk about church, their church and they say, well, I didn't get anything out of it. Oh, really? Hmm, you didn't get anything out of it. My question to them would be, what did you give? What did you give? Because worship, true worship, is not coming to God to get something. It's coming into the presence of God to surrender something, mainly you and I, to Him. That's worship. And the perfume that Mary poured on Jesus was very expensive. But when you truly love somebody, you never think about how much the cost really is, is it? You don't look at that and go, oh, it cost me this much. Well, well I, I, I love this person, but this cost me 25 bucks. I don't want to give it to them because it cost me $25 because it's expensive. When you love somebody, no matter what you have, doesn't mean anything in the cost, doesn't mean anything. And it ought to be more important for us with Jesus Christ, amen? We are to give him our very best, not our seconds and thirds. And Matthew's account confirms that this was very expensive perfume. In Matthew chapter 26, verses 6 through 7, we read these words. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster vial of, and here it says, very costly perfume. And she poured it on his head, and, and as he reclined at the table... Now, we know from, from the criticism that is about to follow, don't we? That this was rare perfume and it was worth a year's salary. And Mary didn't pour just a few drops and think, oh, okay, I'll pour a couple drops and then I'll put the cork back in it and put it back. No. She, first of all, she breaks the neck of the bottle. Then she doesn't just pour a few drops on his head or his feet. She pours the whole thing. This lady gave Christ, gave Jesus all she had. That could have been her retirement plus. Because she could have sold it, well, we know for at least over 300 denarii, a year's wages. But she said, it doesn't matter. I'm worshiping my God. You will recall that in the Old Testament, King David wanted to buy a threshing floor from a Jebusite in order to build an ark for the Lord. And the Jebusite said to King David, he said, no, my Lord, I'll give you the land for free, plus all the oxen and the oxen yokes for wood. Take whatever you want, 
there is no charge for the king. Now, this is over in 2 Samuel 24. And listen to what King David said. I love this. What King David said in verse 24 of 2 Samuel 24. He says, no. Now, this Jebusite says, I'll give it to you, all of it, anything you need. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to the king, King David here. And David says, no. But I will surely buy it from you for a price. And here's the, the neat thing. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. Surrender to God, surrendering all you have, surrendering all I have, will cost, but it should. When we worship God, we give something to the Lord. You and I are giving Him our time, our effort, our talent, our service, our love, and yes, even our financial resources. But let me ask you this, isn't he worthy of it? Because who gave you that job to begin with? You say, well, I went out and I worked for it and I found that job. Who gave you the intelligence to do that job? Well, I studied hard. Who showed you how to study hard? Well, my mom and dad, who showed them? God. It all came from him anyway. So, beloved, let me tell you this right here, right now, it all belongs to him. We just need to be like this woman, Mary, and just give it all to him and say, Lord, it's yours. It's yours. Number three, worship is often criticized, is a criticized act of sacrifice. We saw this last week. We're going to see it again this week. Now, you might think, now, here's, here, they're, they're at this house there in Bethany. Here's these guys sitting around reclining at a table with Jesus. Martha's out in the kitchen. She's doing her thing. She's worshiping God by making these great meals. And Mary runs into her room or the house next door, wherever the, the vial is, and she gets it and she brings it to him, cracks the neck of that bottle, pours it on his head, pours it on his feet. Then she bows down and takes her hair and wipes his feet. You would have thought that some of them people would have applauded, wouldn't you? And said, man, what an act of worship. That's what you thought. But do they? No. No. But when Mary poured out the costly perfume on the Lord, there were people present who criticized her. They said the perfume could have been sold and the money could have used, been used to help the poor. John gives us insight into this criticism. He identifies the chief critic. Look with me over in John's Gospel, the 12th chapter. We're going to see the biggest critic of all. You already know who it is. John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, look down in verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now, it also didn't hurt that Judas Iscariot was also the treasurer. He had the money bag. Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had, had the money box, he used to pilfer what was in it. Judas was not being a nice guy and thinking about those, bless their heart, those poor people out there. We could take this 300 denarii and buy all kinds of food and we could give it to the people and feed them. He wasn't thinking that. Down deep, Judas Iscariot could have cared less. We just read in John's Gospel, he was pilfering out of the box. You know, he was doing this, two for the ministry, three for me. Two for the ministry, four for me. That's what Judas was doing, and that's what all he was caring about. 
And those who pour out their love for Jesus Christ today, some of them are still being criticized. When the world looks at what we do, they say, what a waste. What a waste. As we are sitting in this church right now, there are people driving up and down the highway right behind us. They're going north and they're going south. They're doing this and they're doing that. And some of those people, maybe not all of them, but some of those people right now, they see the cars parked here in our parking lot and some of them are saying, what a waste. What a waste of a morning. Why are these people giving up their Sunday to sing those songs, to study an ancient, in their minds, out-of-date book? What is it going to get them? It's a waste of time. Man, they could be out fishing. They could be out mowing the grass. They could be out doing this. They could be out doing that. Beloved, they just don't get it. They think worship is a waste of time, a waste of your money, and a waste of your energy. But I'm going to tell you this morning, beloved, when you worship Almighty God, the creator of this universe, it is never a waste. Never. Number four, worship is always a prophetic act of recognition. It's always a prophetic act of recognition. When Mary poured the perfume on the Lord, it was more than just an act of worship. She was also anointing his body for his burial. He said that. We read that. That would take place in just a few days. Look at verse 6. Let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. Verse 8. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Now remember, from our, te from our journey in Mark's gospel, just the previous week, our Lord had prophesied several times that he was going to go to Jerusalem where he would be handed over to the Romans and he would be tortured, he would be crucified, he would die, he would be buried, but he also said that he would come back from the grave. But see, that, that, all that death talk just went over the heads of the disciples. They didn't want to think about that. They didn't want to ponder on that. They were some, probably were some of them, were still were arguing who was going to sit on his right hand and who was going to sit his left hand on his throne. That's probably what they were doing. And I can just see Peter being the ringleader of this. Well, I need to be on one side or the other because I'm, I'm the leader right here of the disciples. So I need to be either on his right side or his left side, preferably his right. But that's what they were doing. But the neat thing is, the great thing is, is this young woman, I believe she was a young woman named Mary, she got it. She knew that Jesus was going to die. But she listened to him. She knew that he was going to die on the cross. She knew that he was going to be buried. But bless God and praise God for a woman named Mary. She knew that he was going to be resurrected on the third day. And that her God, her Jesus, was going to be a living Savior. And in a sense, our worship today is a prophetic recognition. We are not, beloved, let me say this as strongly as I know how. And if you don't get anything else out of this message, I pray that you get this. All right? We here today, we need to remember that we are not mourning a dead religious founder. Okay? Let me say that again. We here this morning... We are not gathered here together mourning some dead religious founder. We are here this morning worshiping 
bowing down, blowing a kiss to a living Savior. That is what we're doing here this morning. That is what we do when we come together as a corporate body and we worship God. We're not crying, oh, Jesus has died on the cross. He's still in the tomb. My Savior is dead, just like Allah, just like Muhammad, Allah, Muhammad, and just like Confucius, and just like this one. I almost said Muhammad Ali. Well, he's dead too, folks, and he ain't coming from the grave. Amen? Now, I'm, I don't mean any disrespect. But whether it's Confucius or whether it's whoever, they're dead, they're in that grave. But beloved, when we worship Almighty God, we are worshiping a living Savior. And if you can't get excited about that, let's go home. That ought to just make you want to shout. And every time we worship the Lord, we are announcing to the world that we recognize that He is alive and that He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That, that, and those cars that are going up and down this street behind us, and they're saying, what a waste. We need to say to them, no, it's not a waste. We're worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's alive. And not only that, but here's the other thing we're doing when we're worshiping. We're saying that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So you may be running up and down this highway saying, what a waste. But we know from the Word of God that one day, under force, if they don't accept Christ before they die, they're going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I think at the back of their minds, they're going to think, man, why didn't I stop in that church and listen? So we do it now. And we do it by faith and not by sight. And there's a certain sense of timing here in, in our account, in our story today, that goes along with that extravagant worship. If Mary had not poured the perfume on the Lord at the time that she did, at the time of this dinner, she would have had missed a window of opportunity. The Word of God tells us that on the resurrection day that the other women, you remember, they, they, they crucified Christ, they put Him in that borrowed tomb, they rolled that stone in front of them, and what happens? On the first day of the week, the women ran to the tomb early in the morning, and they were carrying all kinds of spices because they were going to anoint His body. Because He had been crucified and buried so quickly that they didn't have the opportunity to do it. And that's why they were going to the tomb. But you know what? Mary had already done it. Isn't that what our Bible scripture said? He said, she's already prepared for my burial. She's already anointed me for my death. Mary had already done it. And there's an important lesson for us today from this scripture. Never miss the opportunity to worship God. If you feel like worshiping God, beloved, listen. Listen to me. Worship Him. Amen? Worship Him. He's done great things in your life. He has blessed you more than what you and I deserve. The biggest blessing of all is that He's saved us from hell. There's nothing else but just that. We are to, are to stay on our face 24-7 just holding up our hands and saying, God, thank you. Thank you for saving me from hell, if nothing else. But he blesses you day in and he blesses you day out. We cannot miss the opportunity to worship God because we never know when it's the last chance. Now, the fifth thing we need to see is this. Worship can be an honor, an honored act of inspiration. Worship can be an honored act of inspiration. The disciples said, what a waste. Judas Iscariot was the biggest one. I'm sure if there were other friends of theirs there, they were saying the same thing. 
The Lord said, what an investment. They said, what a foolish act. The Lord said, what a beautiful thing. The disciples could only see the cost of that perfume. But the Lord saw the value of her worship. Listen to what the Lord said in verse 9 of our text. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, not just over there in the Middle East, but in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. I love that fact. I love the fact that the Lord knew that the gospel was going to be preached in America. Because he says the whole world. He didn't say just the Middle East, over there in Jerusalem, over there in Israel, over in Bethany. He said the whole world. I love that the word of God is being preached right here in St. Genevieve. That it's being preached in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia, do you know that they're saying today, the scholars and, and biblical researchers are saying that in Africa, in the next few years, Africa will be the heart of the Bible preaching areas? Not America. We once were, but no longer. That Africa will be the center place of the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Praise God. It's being preached throughout the whole world. Today, here we are, about 6,000, roughly about 6,000 miles away from where this event took place in Bethany. But it was also about 2,000 years ago. And we are still fulfilling Jesus' prophecy talking about that woman. He said they would, and beloved, we are. We're telling the story of Mary's act of worship and what we can learn from her. Let me ask you a question this morning. You answered in your heart of hearts. Do you want to build a life that lasts or a memorial? You know, we see all these memorials. Memorials to this, memorials to that. I don't know. Maybe you want to build a life that's a memorial. You know how you do it? You do it like Mary. When we get at the feet of Jesus and worship Him with all of our hearts, that's when we leave a memorial. It outlasts money or anything else. It's a memorial. You've heard me tell the story of my grandmother. A great influence in my life. My grandmother was not a wealthy woman. She had to work all of her life. And then she went on Social Security, just like everybody else does. She was not wealthy in the eyes of the world. But I look back on my grandmother, and I see a woman that started every day in prayer and every day reading her scriptures. I see a woman that in the noon hour would read her Bible and pray. I remember a woman who at the nighttime would read her Bible and pray. And she lived a life. She didn't just read the Bible. She didn't just pray. She lived a life. And you have people in your families that did the same thing. And you'll remember that forever, won't you? And if you want your life to last and have that memorial, do the same thing. Go to the feet of Jesus and worship Him. And do it in front of your kids. Do it in front of your grandkids. Let them see it. Don't hide it. If we had walked up to someone in the Roman Empire about this time, about the first half of the first century, and asked them, who will have the greatest impact on the future of the world? Nero or this lady over there in Bethany named Mary? 
A Roman at that time in the first half of the first century would have went, Psst, Nero, who's this Mary lady? Well, today, we name our daughters Mary, and we name our dogs Nero. And sometimes we don't even do that, especially if you know who Nero was. See the importance? Now, let me leave you with this. There's one final lesson to take away from this beautiful act of worship. And, beloved, that's what it is. It's a beautiful act of this lady worshiping Jesus Christ, her Savior. And I said it earlier. Worship is not about coming to get something from God. Worship is all about us giving Him something. Because when we bless the Lord, you cannot help but be blessed in return. Did you notice what happened when Mary poured out the perfume on his, whether he poured it on his head first, then his feet, or his feet first, and then his head? Did you notice what happened? John writes that the fragrance filled the room. And when Mary took her hair and wiped his feet with her hair, the fragrance of that was on Jesus' feet and, and all that was now on her. And for the rest of the night and probably the next day, wherever she went, she recalled because, and she carried the, the, the fragrance of that worship. Oh, some people might have looked at her and said, Oh, Mary, you smell so sweet today. New perfume. And she would have thought, It was about my Savior. And it reminded her of being with the Lord. Even today, we can usually tell when, when you're around somebody who, who has poured out his or her life to the Lord, can't you? They're just different. There's just something about them. There's a certain spiritual fragrance about them when they've walked with the Lord. There's almost a beautiful, beautiful perfume that accompanies their life. Paul says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. We're a fragrance. Did you know that? We are a sweet aroma for God. I want to smell. Listen, you ready for this? I, I, I'm talking to you personally as your pastor here, as a brother in Christ. I want to smell so much and for so long for Jesus Christ that when I'm around you as a fellow believer, fellow sister, brother in Christ, that you are encouraged to walk with him but I want to smell so much like Jesus because of my walk with Him. When I walk by a, a sinner, they feel the hell's fire licking at their feet. And they go, I want to know Jesus because of my fragrance of walking with God. Amen? Is that what you want? That people can be around you for a split second and they know that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. And if they're a saint, they go, that's a brother or sister in Christ. I can tell. Well, how do you know? I can just tell. But if they're not, they go, that's one of them followers of Jesus. Oh, man. And they walk off and they start thinking of their lives. And they think, man, I need to go to church. I need to know this Jesus. I wonder if I could talk to her. I wonder if I could talk to him. And they would tell me about this man, Jesus. Because you can just tell there's something different. And they get that wild look in their eyes. I wonder if they had talked to me about that man named Jesus. That's what I desire. I hope you desire the same thing. That when people are around you, they can just tell that you're a Christian. Remember what we give to the Lord always comes back to bless us. Did you know that? When you gave in the offering plate, however much you gave, and it's none of my business how much, I don't want to know. I don't need to know. But when you put your money in the offering plate, into the money into the offering plate this morning, 
that we use at this church to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, do you know that God blesses you for that? That that money comes back to you? It may not come back to you with another 10 or another 20, but He will bless you in another way. When you bless the Lord, He blesses back. Amen? And it's a fragrance of worship. You gave this morning not out of a duty, not because, oh, I have to give. You gave because you wanted to worship God. And it's a fragrance of the Lord. I'm going to close with this. As a follower of Jesus Christ, that's us, okay? You and I, who have accepted Him as Lord and Savior however many years ago. Or whether you're listening to this message and, and you're believing in Christ for the first time. I wonder if you would be willing to pray this prayer along with me, a prayer of worship. And it's a prayer of surrender this morning. I'm not saying for you to be saved again. You can't be. Once you're saved, you're saved. Amen? But I'm saying about recommitting your life to a life of worshiping God. I'm going to say this prayer, and if you would, and, and if it, you mean it from your heart, you, you say it quietly in your own heart. All right? So let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Father, first of all, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you that your Son, Jesus Christ, came to this earth. He led a life without sin. But then he went to the cross and he died and he was buried. And, but praise the Lord, he, re, he was resurrected. And whether it's people hearing this message and they're asking, saying this prayer for the first time or whether it's us as Christians and we just need to be reminded of what you've done for us and we need to just recommit our lives to him, help us to pray this prayer. Dear God, Break open and pour every drop of who I am out. I give to you all my pride, all my rights, all my everything. I surrender them to you so that I might know you and love you more. Father, let the only thing that remains of me be a sacrifice to you. That it will be a fragrance to you. A beautiful blessing to all who are near me. Now, Lord, I ask that you work in my heart. And as you speak to my heart, Father... Help me in new commitment of walking with you that I will allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead me. And I will give you my all. Because only you are worthy. And I do this, Father God, in an act of worshiping you being God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand together and turn in your hymnals to page 275, I Surrender All. What a fitting song. You can't follow God totally 100% and hold on to things. Did you know that? You can't do that. It doesn't work. Whenever you become a follower of Jesus Christ, beloved, listen, you've got to give it all to Him. Amen? That's why we sing that song, I Surrender All. Everything I have, everything you have, it belongs to Him, so I just need to, in an act of obedience, say, Lord, I give it all to you. And He says, when you do that, I'll take care of you. I'll bless you. So as we sing this song, beloved, if you want to come forward and you want to just kneel at these front pews and say, God, I give it all to you. Use me. I give it all. You do what the Holy Spirit of God is 
convicting you and showing you. All right? Don't miss the opportunity to worship Him. Let's sing to the Lord.